So this is this is the second lecture on first of the logic. So let's review. Let's review the system of first of the logic. So in first of the logic, propositions are defined as this predicate. So this is called the predicate symbol. And these arguments are called terms. And the propositions inherit all those from propositional logic, such as implication, conjunction, and disjunction, and top and bottom. And new to first of the logic are this universal quantification and existential quantification. And the set of terms, we use meta variables T and S for terms. We have variable, term variables, which are term variables. And we have these parameters. And a parameter is actually a term, unlike this term variable, which is just a placeholder. This parameter actually represents a concrete term, but we know nothing about this term. So that's the difference. And we have this function symbol f applied to other terms. And this is called the function symbol. And as a special case, we have this constant, which is a function symbol with a zero argument. And also remember that this is a function symbol, but this is not a function application. So for example, you don't reduce successor applied to zero to another term such as one. Okay, now let's let's review the inference rules for this universal quantification and existential quantification. To introduce for all x this universal quantification, this is for all introduction rule. You assume some random term that you know nothing about, so its name is going to be a. So you introduce a fresh parameter and, and we assume that this random term has a name a and you try to prove you try to prove a holds for this random term a then you can conclude that a is true for every term x and the elimination rule all x a true. This is for all elimination rule. In this case, a is a true for every term. So if you have a concrete term t, then you may substitute for term variable x in a. That's universal. This this is for all elimination rule. What about the existential? introduction rule. In constructive logic, in order to prove this existence x a, you have to actually find a concrete term t such that a is true for this term t. You have to actually find such a term. So this term is called witness. So if a is true for this concrete term t, then you can conclude there does there exists such a term x. So you have to actually find a such a term yourself. 
the existential elimination rule goes like this existential x a true now we are we know that there exists a term t such some term t that satisfies this predicate a but we don't know what it is actually so all we can do is we assume we assume a new term a certain term whose name is a because we we know that there exists such a term but we know nothing about it so we assume that its name is a so we introduce a fresh parameter a and that assume that a is a true for this parameter a and then you deduce c true and then you finally deduce c true and remember that inside this term c you are not supposed to use parameter a this is not supposed to appear inside the c in other words the scope of parameter a is restricted to this premise only so when you leave this premise when you apply this existential elimination rule you have to somehow discharge it you have to somehow uh, discard a so a is not going to be uh, found inside the c and let's say this w then you annotate it with the w so that's the existential elimination rule so this is the uh, the system for first order logic but among these four rules what characterizes constructive logic is actually this existential elimination rule and this rule explains the big difference between constructive logic which we are looking at in this class and classical logic which interprets this existential quantification in a different way in the case of a constructive logic you have to actually find a term t that satisfies a so for this reason we call such a term as witness but that's not the case in classical logic so let's first review the constructive property constructive nature of this uh, for all an existential quantification in particular this existential quantification so in constructive logic in order to prove existential x a you have to actually present a concrete term t and we call this one a witness and it's not enough just to claim that it's not enough just to claim that there is such a term without knowing it so in other words it's not just enough to claim that there must exist such a term although you don't know what it is that's not enough in constructive logic you have to actually find a term just as indicated by this existential introduction rule you have to actually find this term t in contrast in classical logic you don't have to actually find a term t well if you can find such a term t that's good but it's not required because the notion of existential quantification in classical logic is you just show that there must exist such a term that's all without having to present the identity of such a term so you can interpret this one as it can't be the case that there does not exist so in classical logic this existential quantification means that it cannot happen that there does not exist such a term so note here that we are not actually talking about the existence of a term t a witness we are just debating over whether there exists such a term or that there does not exist such a term 
And we are not interested in the actual identity of a term t. So that's a big difference. So actually, it turns out that in classical logic, this existential quantification can be derived by composing negation and for all. But to better understand that the constructive nature of this existential quantification, let's consider the equivalence between these two these two propositions. Uh oh. So the question is. Are these two propositions logically equivalent? Which means that this proposition implies this one and this proposition implies this one. So one uh, so the question now is are these two propositions logically equivalent? So the reasoning in classical logic Actually, sorry, the reasoning in constrictive logic reflects the reasoning in our human language. So we can actually try to prove or disprove the equivalence between these two by building derivation tree. But it's a really good exercise to think about the equivalence or non-equivalence by interpreting the meaning of these two propositions. So let's try to interpret the meaning of these two propositions in the human language. This proposition says there exists a term such that A is not true. So if this is the case, you can actually find a concrete term T such that A is not true. Now, Starting with this proposition, can we prove this proposition? I mean, it's a truth. This proposition says every for every term x, a is true. That's not the case. And now we have this term t for which a is not true. So we can actually uh, try to interpret this one by focusing on this term t. So perhaps because we have actually concrete the term t, this should be easy to prove. And by building derivation tree, we can verify our reasoning in the human language. So let's try to prove this one. Existential x negation a. Does this guy imply negation for all x a true? So you will see that the derivation tree that we are building closely reflects the reasoning in the human language. Let's try to prove this. We have to apply implication introduction rule and we have to prove this one starting with. Of uh, this hypothesis, let's just say this is the W. And in order to prove this negation, we have to prove bottom true, starting with starting with another a new hypothesis. Uh -oh. For all x a true. So let's say this is but uh, uh, negation introduction rule, and this is a Z. Now the question is, can we somehow compose these two, combine these two, produce this uh, this contradiction, and? Perhaps it's easy to show the contradiction because by eliminating by eliminating 
this existential quantification, we can actually consider a concrete term, although we have to use a parameter a. So let's eliminate this existential quantification. So you are applying existential elimination rule. Then, then you can use, uh, uh, let me move it over here. This is uh, for all x a true. Okay. So by applying this existential elimination rule, you assume a parameter a for x for which this negation a true holds. And the question is, can we produce this contradiction? And it looks like it's pretty easy because we have this one is negation a for x a true. So this one says, for this particular term a, a is not true. But this one says, every term x is going to satisfy a. So these two contradict each other. So by combining these two, we can actually prove a bottom true. Specific, more specifically, you can apply this for all elimination rule using term a, parameter a for x a true. So now we have this one and its negation. And so by combining these two, we can produce bottom two. So in this way, you can actually show that this proposition implied this one by building this derivation tree. And if you analyze this derivation tree, the story ordered by this derivation tree is precisely the reasoning that in the human language. So that's actually the beauty of constructive logic. Everything that you can prove in constructive logic, for example, using this derivation tree, can be interpreted in the human language as well. Because constructive logic reflects the logical reasoning in the human language, and vice versa. Now, so we have just seen that this one implies this one. And the proof is actually quite easy, because thanks to the existential quantification, you can actually talk about a concrete term, A. But what about the other direction? So let's try to prove the converse. Negation for all x a, does this guy imply existential negation a? And if we recall the constructive nature of this existential quantification, it should be immediately clear that this is not provable. And the reason is, in order to prove this existential quantification, you have to actually present, find a concrete term T for which negation A is true. But it looks like you can never actually create such a term T out of this negation. It just says it's not the case that every term X has a uh, every term x satisfies a. So interpreted in the human language, this proposition never never introduces any concrete term. It just says you cannot find a term x that satisfies a. So out of this statement, you cannot actually discuss any further because you don't have any concrete term t whether it satisfies A or it doesn't satisfy A, it doesn't matter because out of this proposition, you cannot actually extract a concrete term T. But in order to prove this one, you have to actually present a concrete term T. So it looks like this doesn't make sense. 
even in the human language. So let's try to prove this one. Perhaps the derivation tree will get stuck. So let's prove negation for all x a implies existential x negation a true. So in order to prove this, you have to apply implication introduction rule. And let's assume negation for all x a true as a new hypothesis. And we want to prove existential x negation a true. And here, we cannot make any progress because in order to prove this one by applying, for example, existential introduction rule, you have to present some term t. But at this moment, we, have, we know no term uh, that we can substitute for this variable x because in this derivation tree, we never introduced a, a concrete term t yet. So we cannot make a progress this way, bottom up. So the, if there, so if there exists a proof, if we could complete this derivation tree, we would have to proceed top down here. Okay, so this fails. This bottom up approach fails. So we have to apply. Uh, we have to eliminate this negation. So in order to apply this elimination rule here, we have to present negation, uh, oh, sorry, negation elimination rule. And then the goal now is to prove for all x a true. And by combining these two, you can prove bottom true. And bottom true automatically implies this one this bottom elimination rule. So we already see that something, something wrong is going on here. So intuitively, we'd like to find a proposition here that is sufficient to prove this one, but not such a powerful contradiction. This is too powerful to prove this one. So there's something wrong uh, in this approach. But anyway, but, but nevertheless, we, this is the only way to make progress if there is a proof. If we could complete this derivation tree, this is the only way we could make progress. But now we have to prove this one, and there is no way to prove this one. Because no extra information about A is provided here. So we get stuck here. So informally, we can show that this is not provable, which complies with our intuitive reasoning that this doesn't make sense. But remember that this is not formal proof. It just follows our intuition. And then it looks like this derivation tree is impossible to complete. So it's, a, it's a informal reasoning. But later when we learn sequential calculus, we can actually formally prove that this is not provable. So we discussed the equivalence between this one, existential x negation a, and uh, negation for all x a. So, uh, these two proportions are not logically equivalent. This one implies this one, not the other way. But in classical logic, these two propositions are logically equivalent. In fact, in classical logic, you can actually define existential x a as negation for all x negation a. And Conversely, you can define for all x a as negation, existential x, negation a. So these are two equivalence, these are two uh, logical equivalences are justified in classical logic, but that's not true in constructive logic. So if you read this logical equivalence, it really means that in classical logic, existence means that 
it cannot happen that it does not exist. So it looks like a double negation. So we have seen this one. Let's look at another example to further discuss the constructive nature of this existential quantification. We'd like to discuss this one. For all x a implies existential x a true. So it looks like this proposition makes sense even in the human language. This one says, let's just say, for example, everybody is happy. Okay, so this is everyone is happy. And in the human language, this could be interpreted as, for example, somebody is happy. So intuitively, this statement appears to make sense. If everybody is happy, then somebody must be happy. Perhaps to your surprise, this is not provable in constructive logic. It's not provable. And why is that? In order to prove somebody happy in constructive logic, you have to actually bring that person. You have to actually provide this witness who is happy. It could be anyone, but you are supposed to bring a concrete witness, somebody who is really happy. But this statement, everyone happy, does not really say some particular person who is known to be happy. It just says everybody is happy, but you cannot tell who he is. So now we start to see that there's something missing in this statement, even in the human language. In fact, you can try to, in fact, you can try to prove this one, and then the proof will get stuck. But we don't even have to actually try to build a derivation tree because I can convince you that this doesn't make sense, even in the human language. Let's say, let's change the example slightly. Say, everyone in this room is happy. And then you have to show that someone in this room is happy. So the question is, does this statement logically imply this second statement? At first, it appears like this implication makes sense. If everybody is happy in this room, then somebody has to be happy. But the trouble is, what if there's nobody in this room? In this room, there's nobody. But this is definitely a feasible assumption. We can make this assumption, and it could actually occur in the real world, I could go to a, I could visit a room where nobody is listening to me, and then I could claim everybody in this room is happy. So does this statement true if the room is empty? And the answer is yes, it's trivially true. If the room is empty, if there's nobody in this room, this statement is trivially true. On the other hand, if the room is empty, this statement is right away false. Because there's nobody in this room, so you cannot actually say somebody in this room is happy. So we have just learned that this statement, which at first appeared like false, actually makes sense even in the human language. And what about this one? A slightly different example for Y or all X A implies existential X A true. 
where we make an assumption that y is not found, y is not used in A at all. So compare this new proposition with the previous one. There's no difference except that we prevented the proposition with this vacuous quantification, universal quantification. It looks like this is useless because y is not found at all inside this proposition. But it turns out that it makes actually big difference this assumption, uh, I mean, this assumption, this quantification. Let's try to prove this one. It turns out that this one is not provable and you cannot actually build a derivation tree. But what about this one? It's proof for all y, for all x a, implies existential x a true. So in order to prove this one, you have to apply for all introduction rule. But this one has no effect, almost no effect, because y is not found in proposition A. So even if you try to introduce some parameter A and substitute it for variable y inside this one, this proposition does not change because y is not found at all. So even after applying this full introduction rule bottom up, you still have the same proposition. So it looks like the problem has been reduced to the previous problem proving the, this judgment. But there is a big difference and the difference is we have introduced a concrete term A. Now we know that there is actually a term, although we know nothing about this term, and we know that its name is A. Now we can discuss this concrete term. And now it should be straightforward to complete the remainder of this derivation tree because we have this concrete term. So let's try to prove prove existential A true by applying implication introduction rule, starting with this one. Uh, let's say this is W. And then in order to prove this existential quantification, you have to actually present a concrete term, some concrete term. But now we have this concrete term, so we can use this one instead. So a for x, a true. And can you prove this? Yes, because this proposition, this judgment says a is true for every term x, including a. So by applying for all elimination rule, you can prove this. So in the end, we can, uh, we can notice that the presence of this universal quantification is tantamount to making another assumption that the room is not empty. It is not empty. Although we don't know the person, any person in this room, but we know that thanks to this universal quantification, we know that the room is not empty. So there got to be somebody. So if the room is not empty, and you can interpret it in the human language, this one says, the room is not empty. Room is not empty, not empty. Then everybody, everyone in this room is happy. Then somebody in this room is happy. And the answer is a yes, because the room is not empty. So there got to be somebody. And let's say that the somebody is A. And this somebody is happy. So now let's compare these two, this proposition and this proposition. This is provable, but the previous one is not provable.
And this y is never used inside this proposition. So to summarize these two findings, we can conclude that in constructed logic, for all x a is not necessarily equivalent to a, even if x is not used in a. Because this has a very important implication, which is the set of terms is not empty. But if you are given this proposition alone, you don't know whether the set of terms is empty or not. So the course note has another example, negation existential x a. The equivalence between this one and existential x negation a. And the question is, are these two propositions logically equivalent? This one implies this one and vice versa. And perhaps you can now see that this one is harder to prove because in order to prove existential x, you have to actually bring a concrete witness t. You have to actually find such a term. And this is always harder than uh, expected. So perhaps this one is harder to prove. But on the other hand, the other direction, this one is easy to prove if it is actually uh, true. Because the presence of this existential quantification allows you to assume a concrete term. Although you don't know what it is, so you have to actually assume its name is A by introducing a parameter. So going this direction, you assume a concrete term A, and this A does not satisfy A, this property. And then can we discuss this one? Can we prove this negation existential X A? Uh, I sorry, I made a big mistake. Oh, uh, this one is actually. So, uh, you can try to establish the logical equivalence between these two. I mean, if the logical equivalence is in fact true, either by reasoning in the human language or by trying to trying to build a derivation tree. But I would suggest you try the first approach to better understand the meaning of this existential quantification, the universal quantification in the constructive logic. In classical logic, this is pretty easy to see because, for example, negation, existential x a is logically equivalent to negation for all x uh, negation a, and you prefend negation here, and in classical logic, this double negation cancels itself. So you obtain this logical equivalence. So in classical logic, this is true, but perhaps that's not the case in constructive logic. And I encourage you students to try the first approach, try to interpret these two propositions in the human language and see if the one the first one logically implies the second one and the other way around. Finally, to show the local soundness and local completeness. Remember that for every logical connective, let's say implication, conjunction, disjunction, and for all and existential quantification. We try to explain the meaning of these logical connectives with introduction rule and elimination rule. So now we have a bunch of inference rules. 
And the first step to establish the, the logical soundness of this logical system is to analyze this pair of introduction and elimination rules. And this pair satisfies certain form of soundness and completeness. And it is local soundness and local completeness. In order to show the local soundness, we show that a proof or derivation tree that contains a detour. Detour is introduction rule immediately followed by elimination rule. So this is a detour. By showing that this detour can be eliminated, we establish local soundness. For local completeness, for example, if you have a conjunction B true, figuratively, you try to extract as much information from this A conjunction B true, and then recreate the same judgment. That's the idea. So let's repeat the same exercise, but this time for this universal quantification and existential quantification. So for, for universal quantification, introduction followed by elimination rule. So we have for all introduction rule. So you assume some parameter and then you have this elimination rule. So you substitute T for variable X. So now we have detour, intro followed by LM. The question is, can we prove this one directly. And the idea is pretty simple. So we make a copy of this derivation tree over here, but note that we use this parameter A. So it's just a matter of replacing this parameter A with this term T. So if you, uh, let's just say this proof is a D, then you visit every part of this derivation tree and replace A with the term T. Then A, uh, A disappears and we instead use a T. Therefore, what this guy proves is this one, A for X, A true, where A has been replaced by T. But composing these two substitutions generated this one. So these two propositions are identical. So in this way, you can prove uh, the same judgment without taking this detour. So we have just uh, established the local soundness. What about local completeness? Um, we have a for all x a true, we have some proof of this form, and uh, we'd like it to expand it. Uh -oh. We'd like it to expand it. How can you prove for all x a true? Well, you have to prove a for x a true. This is the for all introduction rule, which introduces new parameter a. And how can you prove this? Remember that inside this premise, a is a term that you can use for free. Although we don't know any property of this term, but we know that there is a term A. Well, you make a copy of this one, so for all x a true, and then you, you eliminate it. This is a for all elimination rule. And then for x, you substitute A. So it's just a matter of applying for elimination rule and applying full introduction rule again. Next, existential quantification. Uh, just a moment. So what about existential quantification?
So suppose that we have an uh, intro followed by a limb. So we have for all, uh, sorry, existential x a true. This is introduction rule. So we have a concrete witness here, and then we apply elimination rule, and then we deduce C true. So from here, we introduce a parameter A, so x for A, A true. This is new hypothesis, let's say this is the W. And then you deduce C true. But remember that this parameter A is a local to this premise. Which means that A is not found inside the C. C contains no instance of A. So we have this existential introduction rule followed by existential elimination rule. So how can we reduce this one without taking this detour? We are supposed to prove C true directly. And the idea is we exploit this derivation tree in the premise. And the key observation here is this proposition C does not contain this term variable, uh, sorry, parameter A. So we compose this derivation tree with this one by substituting T for X, uh, sorry, T for A. And then what happens? Then you basically you apply this substitution in this entire derivation tree, then you have to apply the same substitution on this proposition C, but it has no effect because, because the, this proposition C does not contain this parameter A. So even if you apply this, this substitution, it's going to have no effect. So now you have this one, and by composing these two substitutions produces T4x. So we could instead write T4x here. But we have a proof of T4x a true here. So you make a copy of this one and place it over here. Then you have a direct proof of a C true. So in this way, we can show the uh, local soundness. What about local completeness? Suppose that you have this proof. And how can you prove existential A true? Well, you cannot apply existential introduction rule right away because in order to apply this existential introduction rule you have to find a concrete term t but at this moment we have no term no term that we can use so the only way to make a progress is somehow take advantage of this existing proof so you Eliminate it, existential elimination rule, and then you could have a4 x a true. This is new hypothesis a w. Uh -oh. But this proposition already implies that there exists a term x such that a is true. So just by applying this. Existential elimination rule, you can prove the same judgment. So what is going on here is you we exploited the existing judgment 
somehow by applying this elimination rule and then show that the same judgment is true. 